Good afternoon and welcome to the 2020-21 Student Member of the, of the Board of Education debate. My name is Pariti Cherry and I am CRASC Secretary of Education. I will be moderating today's debate. Here's how the debate will work. Each candidate will have three minutes to speak and introduce themselves. The order of speakers has been determined by a random drawing prior to this debate. Questions for the candidates have been submitted by CRASC as well as online via our website www.aacps.org slash CRASC. The candidates have not had the opportunity to review the questions prior to the debate. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to the question with a 30 second rebuttal. Please be advised that this debate is being broadcasted live on AACPS TV and via AACPS's live stream channel. Once all questions have been addressed, each candidate will have an opportunity to give brief closing remarks. Now we will start with introductions. First, Connor Curran from Old Mill High School. Hello everyone, my name is Connor Curran and I'm running for the student member of the Board of Education. I'm currently a junior at Old Mill High School and I'm, one, I'm running for one reason, all of you. In the past, I've served as Secretary of Education of CRASC representing all 83,000 students of AACPS to the Board of Education. And currently I serve as President of CRASC. Now, I'm ready to serve you as your next student member of the Board of Education. There are many measures that I can take as a fully voting board member while on the dais. There are many difficult situations that could occur within this next school year, especially during this global pandemic. And during every situation, I'll make sure I'll keep you in mind because that's the only way I know how to represent you through my six years of experience. As small, my priorities include increasing mental health resources, increasing financial literacy, and ensuring equitable distribution of funding. To increase, to increase mental health resources, I've done the research with how many counselors we have. According to my calculations, we have 222 counselors system-wide. That puts us at a student to counselor ratio of one to 378. According to the American School Counselor Association, the student, count, the student to counselor ratio should be around one to 250 students. To get to that magic number, we need to get an additional 113 counselors. Now, I'm not going to promise that I will add those, count, those amount of counselors within one year. That is just not possible. However, I'll, I promise that I'll start the conversation to get a rapid amount of counselors in our schools. For financial literacy, I believe it's important that we as students are getting this education to be financially knowledgeable. To do this, I'm very open about how we can how it can be done, whether it's a graduation requirement or integrating into further courses that already exist. However, the school system has reported that we have financial literacy components in algebra one and US government. Personally, as a student who've been through both of those courses and have seen have not seen merely enough of those standards, we as a system, school system must do more for our students for after school, for after high school. I have two components for my equitable distribution of funding plan. For starters, I'm well aware that the budget is going to have to be cut with this upcoming school year immensely due to the coronavirus. To ensure that our construction projects are well on the way, I'll make sure that the school system has a plan to continue those ongoing projects. They're not fully funded yet. We also need more ESOL, uh, more funding for the ESOL program. This includes adding more bilingual facilitators, bilingual teachers, and bilingual teaching assistants and facilitators. This is vital to the mission of the school system as we attempt to eliminate all gaps and elevate all students. We cannot do this efficient, efficiently if we do not do more for our English language learner students. They are struggling with the minimal amount of resources within our school system and their families are struggling too. In conclusion, these are not the only things I am passionate about. Minutes. Sorry to cut you off. Um, next, we'll have Princess Merritt from Mead High School. Hi, my name is Princess Merritt. I am a current junior at Mead High School. I am the president of our SAD chapter, which is Students Against Destructive Decisions, and I currently serve as vice president of CRASC. I've been in CRASC since I was in eighth grade, and I've continuously advocated for you, the students, by speaking at the board, county council meetings, and so many other things. Now, due to COVID-19, we are going to have to make budget cuts, and now is the time more than ever that we have to prioritize our students and our teachers. As a SMOB, I will advocate vigorously, not only for mental health resources, but early childhood education access and opportunities for all students. 
I think that some things that we need to do better on is our mental health resources and valuing all mental health, whether it be elementary, middle, or high school. There is no age limit on mental health, and I think that is something that we as a county need to strive to do better on. When I was talking to the schools, I talked to the children about everything from bathrooms to construction to mental health to how they want windows and I think that the best thing that we can do now is not only talk to the students but unify as one county. Unity is my main goal and as a SMOP I will promise that I not only will go to each and every school to talk to you guys the students but I will try to go to at least one event a month and I think that as SMOP my duty is to not only work on making our schools a better and safer place and environment but it's to also fight for our teachers. Our teachers are severely behind on their steps due to the freeze in 2008, and they can no longer teach us. They have to worry about their own families, and a teacher should not have to decide between teaching the students that they have grown to love or going into debt. This is not okay, and this is something that I will fight for even if I'm not elected a SMOB. Thank you. Thank you, Princess. And now we will have Drake Smith from Mead High School. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all safe and well during these uncertain times. My name is Drake Smith. I'm a 17-year-old junior enrolled in the IB Diploma Program at Mead High School. I want to be the student member of the Board of Education so I can empower, engage, and elevate every student in AACPS. But this will be no easy task due to our current situation. But for my time as president of the Anne Arundel County NAACP Youth and College Division, I have seen many times what can happen when we all stand united for one goal. This year, the student member of the Board of Education will inherit a school system never seen by their predecessors. They will inherit a school system rocked by a global pandemic. Now they, will, now they will have the added responsibility of making sure the school system not only recovers, but is stronger than it was before the pandemic. Parents are unemployed, loved ones have passed away, and this means some students have been hit harder than others and will need more resources to help them recover. That is why if elected, I'll make sure we continue to hand out meals and Chromebooks so students stay nourished and have the proper technology access at home. I will also make sure that proper guidance resources are available countywide so students can recover mentally. Once the majority of students are back to normal, then I will start pushing for my four policy areas, which are the environment, student engagement, equity, and student wellness. I will try and make our schools greener by expanding recycling programs, putting solar panels on school roofs, and growing gardens. The gardens will help the environment, but also provide the students an outlet to escape the hardships they may, be, they may be facing. I will keep students engaged by adding more field trips to cultural places and cultural assemblies so students from an early age can see that we have more similarities than differences. I will try to get activity buses in high schools so more high school students will be able to enjoy extracurriculars or get help. I will also fight to make it, to make it that students can only get assigned 30 minutes of homework a night. Now more, than, now more than ever, students are given more and more work after school and still have to juggle it with things like jobs, sports, and even taking care of younger siblings. Less homework means more sleep, and more sleep leads to a focused and more, and more successful students. I will also make it a priority to open the student member of the Board of Education elections to all middle and high school students. Because to me, it doesn't make sense that our student member has full voting rights, but is only elected by a few hundred students. To make more healthy students, I will fight to put feminine products in the girls' bathrooms and I will work towards the restoration of school bathrooms. And I will put hand sanitizer dispensers in every classroom so students can sanitize more frequently because we all know we like to high five and dap of our friends throughout the day and that's a lot of germs. So better bathrooms and hand sanitizers are a necessity because sanitation is conducive to a good education. I will also fight to give every student one mental health day a quarter because students are getting overwhelmed and we need, to, we need to let them know it's okay every once in a while to take a step back and to take a step back from it all and find your bearings. Those are only a few of my ideas and you can find the rest on my Instagram at Drake underscore uh, the number four underscore SMOB. Some of my ideas are big and some of them are small, but they're all to help the students succeed in this hectic world. Thank you. Thank you. Now, at this time, we'll begin with the questions. So the first question is, what do you consider to be the biggest problem facing AACPS? And we'll start with Connor. Currently, the biggest problem facing our own county public schools is access to education. Right now, in this global pandemic, 
we are struggling to make sure that every student has access to their Google Classrooms that we are setting up for our school system. Um, to kind of build on that, we need to make sure that we are giving out as many Chromebooks as we can to our students and making sure that they have the access to that education with Wi-Fi. Thank you. Um, next, Princess. So I would like to say the same thing. I do also think it's access to education, but I also think it's the quality of education that we're getting. It's hard for everyone during this e-learning time, and we're going to see a lot of students fall behind because it's nearly impossible to get the same education. I myself am starting to struggle in math, which is a place that I never struggled before. And so um, there's no classification on your socioeconomic status to say how bad you are struggling, but I definitely do think that the lack of resources and lack of technology in some homes is definitely a strife that a lot of our students are facing. Thank you. Um, next, Drake. The biggest issue facing AACPS right now is the coronavirus, of course. But before that, it's the achievement gap. We have students that don't know these wonderful op opportunities are out there like CRASC, because we don't have a, a morning announcement period where most students can like hear everything going on in the county. One of my platforms is to make sure that there's a five minute morning announcement block in every school where it's over the PA system, not just an email to a teacher and you expect the teacher to read it out. Also, we need to make sure our students, like Princess was saying, are fully funded and have full access to education at home. That's why I also want to continue to distribute Chromebooks uh, after the coronavirus, during the next school year, and the next, and for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Does anyone have any rebuttals? Princess? So, um, I have more of a question to Drake. How are we going to fund the continuing of uh, funneling out Chromebooks, especially when a lot of our middle school and elementary schoolers still need Chromebooks in the classroom? Well, the school system is getting $11 million from the state, from the federal government as recovery funding from the coronavirus. So we can put that and use that for the Chromebooks. Also, we have a whole bunch of Chromebooks in the classrooms that, that are old, not being used, and we can hand those out. Because you might have a class of 20 students or 25 students and a class set of 30 in high schools all around the, the county and middle schools. And I've seen it, and I know you've seen it. So we can take those extra Chromebooks and start handing those out. Thank you, Drake. The next question we'll start with Drake with. We'll start with Drake on. The second question is What are ways that we can expand opportunities through programs of choice? IB, STEM, PVA, CAT South, and North. What we can do more is inform kids about it and what exactly it will entail in, in early middle school and not just wait until their eighth grade year. Because when I went to middle school, I went to MacArthur Middle School, we didn't start taking field trips to CAT North. Cat cell. We didn't really learn exactly what the IB program was until our eighth grade year. So what we can do more is just educate students starting in sixth grade, starting in fifth grade that say, hey, we have these wonderful opportunities available for you in high school. And you and so we so the students can start exploring at an early age so they don't feel overwhelmed in their eighth grade year to say, do I want to do STEM? Do I want to do IB? Do I want to do BEMA? Just so they have more time to just think about it. Thank you. Next, Connor. So one way in the capacity of the student of the uh, office that is at hand here is work more with the magnet office to advertise uh, the the wonderful magnet of uh, programs of choice that we have here in Interon County. Uh, if you look at some of the uh, magnet programs that we uh, that, that are in this uh, country right now, we have a very a variety of of programs that we have here that are that can really um, bring our students up to the next level, and not even to mention um, the uh, the Cat North and Cat South programs that are available readily available to our students. Thank you, Princess. I agree with that, but I would also say going into the elementary schools because our magnets don't just start in high schools, they start in the middle schools as well. So I think going into the elementary schools and explaining some of the opportunities and some of the access that the county has, if it's not the easiest for you to get transportation or if you can't be picked up. So I think that going in and explaining the opportunity and the access is imperative for our kids to make the decision. 
Thank you. Does anyone have any rebuttals? Um, yes, on that note, yeah, instead of like having to add brand new courses, we can use career days in the elementary schools where you can have tech pe people in the tech industry, people in construction fields say, hey, STEM opportunities got me to where I am. Cat North, Cat South got to me, got me to where I am. So we can just use career days, things we already have in the school system to get to make it more known about these wonderful programs. Thank you. Next question. If you had the ability to reallocate money in the budget, what would you change? We'll start with Princess. So if I could reallocate funds, I would definitely give more funds to early childhood education. So I would work for all day ECI and pre-K. Around uh, $20,000 a year goes to um, funding um, daycare for children in our county. And with COVID-19, the prices are going to go up and the income is going to go down. And so we're putting a lot of our families in a difficult economic situation. And a lot of our students are going to fall behind at a young age. And I think that we're doing an extreme disservice to our kids by not offering these programs to them. Thank you. Next, Drake. I would take less money that we spend on um, standardized testing because we can't just use one test to um, to find out how good our students are doing. And I would take that money and I would put it into school beautification because if you like going to where you learn at and you enjoy it and you respect the bathrooms and the, um, the environment, you'll do much more better in school. I know because I went to Seven Oaks Elementary School. That was built in 2005. It's a beautiful elementary school, and I did great. I think everybody did great. I went to MacArthur Middle School, built in 67. I went to, I go to Mead High School, built in 77. These are older schools, and in my opinion, they're kind of, kind of ugly. And some students don't like going to school, and this is a big reason why you see students fail, and just they're just apathetic to what they're doing in school. So school beautification, a fresh coat of paint, maybe some skylights, maybe some more windows. School gardens, definitely yes. Because if you're overwhelmed in the classroom setting and they send it to the principal's office, it might be easier to take a break and sit in a garden and say, hey, this and that's is your time awesome. Next, um, Connor. So that we as a school system can provide adequate education to all students, what I would do is add more funding to our ESOL programs to make sure that our English language learner students have the access to thrive in our school system. It does not matter how nice the school building is, if they do not have the resources, they cannot thrive. Thank you. Does anyone have any rebuttals? Princess? So I would like to rebuttal the fresh coat of paint. So for Mead High School, as an example, they're getting a major renovations to the school, so it wouldn't make sense economically to um, put money into fresh coats of paint or things that aren't necessities for students right now when in the foreseeable future there's 126 million dollars going for renovations along uh, similar things for schools like old mill and the middle schools and the elementary schools of quarterfield so schools like these are going to see renovations in the future so um, spending money now doesn't make sense when we're in uh this COVID 19 time thank you Drake. did you have a response go ahead um, that's just one school, and we have all these other older schools that are not getting renovated in the near future. So yes, don't use it on Mead. We can use it on other schools that definitely need these coats of paint. And to Connor's thing with the ESOL students, I love that. More resources for them. But also, take the ESOL students out of their ESOL classrooms and integrate them with the other English-speaking students. Because we all know that if you're just surrounded by English, maybe one day out of the week, two days out of the week, you'll pick up English faster, and you'll be able to just... Um, not assimilate, but you'll just be able to grasp our culture and become a better student in AACPS. And that's your time. Fourth question, how should AACPS prioritize the needs of students from diverse backgrounds to narrow the opportunity gap? And this question was inspired by Lily from South River. We'll start with Connor. Many of our schools currently have some sort of like cultural fair I know at my school we have the Multicultural Fair at Annapolis High School. They have International Night. We can incentivize doing more of those programs so that our students are well aware of what other cultures kind of uh, practice. And I feel like that benefits um, students immensely. And that's something that we need to push more. Thank you. Um, next, Princess. 
So I definitely agree with that, but I also think that is something we could do is put it into the uh, volunteer portal that we want to do these nights. I know I go to Mead and we were invited to come into a fair um, that promoted inclusion of all schools. And so I think doing things like that at each school will not only allow for us to see the different cultures um, countywide, but also countrywide. I know there's in my school's media center, we have flags representing the different uh, nationalities of students who attend our school and it's constantly growing. And so I think things like these in schools would not only benefit the students, but it would also make a more welcoming environment to students who aren't necessarily of um, the American nationality. Thank you. Drake? Uh, can you repeat the question? Yes. How should, how should AACPS prioritize the needs of students from diverse backgrounds to narrow the opportunity gap? Well, with that, if you want to show, show cultures to uh, other students, don't wait until high school to do this in these uh, community fairs in high school. Start in the elementary school. We take field trips every year in elementary school to the zoo, and students love animals. So instead of going to the zoo, maybe one year in second grade, you can go to a mosque or a synagogue, and you can say, hey, not all Muslims, they're not terrorists, they're just like me. We have more similarities than we do differences that we can come together. Also, you have to also look at whenever you're trying to get more resources for any group of students, you want to look at their socioeconomic background. What do they already have? So we're not just giving them stuff that they don't need, that they can't use, but stuff that will benefit them where they're at right now in society. Thank you. Does anyone have any rebuttals to those answers? Yes, Connor. Go ahead. I was just using high schools as experience, but it definitely is important that we widespread this with every level of education. And it's definitely important that we kind of look at where our students are coming from with like the farms program and see how we can best help those communities. Thank you. Princess, you have a and I see that in all middle schools this occurs, but I know in my element or elementary schools rather, elementary schools this occurs, but I know in my elementary school they have um, a cultural little parade and we go and we have passports and we learn about different cultures. I know I learned how to use chopsticks when I was in kindergarten and so learning about stuff like that and trying different foods from different cultures was amazing to me and it opened me up to be a global thinker. And I know they do the same thing because my four-year-old niece was telling me about how she loved that part of her school as well. And that's your time. Okay, next question. How do you believe AACPS can enhance its systems of career readiness? Drake, we'll start with you. Like I said before, just expose students to these careers. College is not for everybody, and that's okay. But we need to start earlier and not just funneling them starting in middle school, but not just funneling them into one di different system like IB or STEM, but showing them all these things are out there. If you want to go into politics, go into politics. If you want to go into cybersecurity, go into cybersecurity or agriculture, you can go into agriculture. We need more farmers in the United States. We just gotta give them a wide variety, starting young, like with career day. We also have career days in elementary school and we didn't have them in middle school. Keep career days going, because as students grow up and they're exposed to more and more jobs, they'll say, hey, I can do that. And this will do another thing. It will keep students engaged, like me. I work every day to try and get into the college of my dreams. And we can make students work every day to get into the job or the um, career of their dreams. So just exposing them earlier and earlier will help this. Thank you. Next, we'll have Connor. So there is a multitude of uh, ways that we as a school system can get our students ready for after college, for after um, for after high school, so for like career readiness. So there's um, the AVID program that can help you get um, kind of get into college. You have our magnet programs that kind of uh, push us as students. We have our Cat North and Cat South programs that can get you um, certifications right out of high school. We need to advertise more of these programs and kind of expand at them so that we can uh, provide more after or career readiness resources. Thank you. Princess? Um, I 100% agree with what my um, 
opponents said, but I also want to go and talk about scholarships for students who want to take a gap year or for students who want to go into the VOTEC trade and grants and stuff like that, because it's a lot easier to get a scholarship if you want to go to college. My PTSA ended up um, putting out a scholarship for students who weren't on the college and career path, and I was on the executive board, and so that's something that I think is very unique, giving kids the funding and saying, it's okay if college isn't your preferred career path there's a way that you can be successful and not necessarily go to college but be a beautician or be a electrician or be a plumber or be a farmer we just need to advertise that and um, kind of el eliminate that stigma that college is the only way thank you princess does anyone have any rebuttals to the questions answers okay next question how do you define success when evaluating the school system we'll start with princess that's loaded. Um, I would evaluate success holistically and see how students are, if they are healthy, wealthy, and wise, and that's what my mom says to me. If they are rich with knowledge, if they are able to see the world holistically and they're able to um, not be tolerant, but be caring and loving to all different types of cultures and to be healthy, to be physically and mentally healthy. And they're able to do their schoolwork, but they're also able to be good people. And our rates of bullying and bias motivated behavior are decreasing. And also we're seeing funding go to kids who need it. And we're seeing more kids not necessarily go to college, but be on a career path, whether it be college or whether it be VOTEC or whether it be, excuse me, um, beauticians, anything that students want to do with their life, they're able to achieve and they're not set back by things like opportunity gaps. Thank you. Drake? That's just the thing. Don't always focus on success. We need to start, stu start teaching students that it's okay to fail, but it's not okay to not get back up. We need to teach our students from an early age that I am capable. So to measure success, you really have to, you can't look at a holistically like all schools or the whole county or the graduation rate. Uh, yes, the graduation rate. You have to look at it, go by teacher to teacher. Say, hey, do you think if your students, let's say a ninth grade teacher, do you think your if your math students were put in the real world right now, do you think they would succeed? The teacher says, yes, okay. If they say no, what are you, what can you do better to make them succeed? We just got to make sure our teachers know when to look for success and when to look for if students are failing and try to boost them up. Because oftentimes you see students fail one test after getting A's for years and years and years, and they just get depressed. They just get depressed. I've seen it a lot, and it's terrible. We got to teach students to get back up and throw some more punches. Thank you, Drake. Um, Connor. I think the way that we measure success as a school system is how we support our students as a whole. So it's also talking about the resources that are given throughout their entire career when they're with our school system. Something that I really think that we can improve on is how well our students are um, with financial um, knowledge. That is something that we are struggling on. And these are, quite the, these are uh, things that students want to learn, but we do not have a widespread uh, curriculum for our students to get that knowledge. Thank you, Connor. Does anyone have any rebuttals to the answers? No? Okay. Next question. How can the school system support students affected by the mental health crisis? And how will you help reduce the stigma of mental health with your position? And this question was inspired by Caroline from South Southern High. We'll start with Connor. So there's an obvious answer to that, first of all. It's adding more counselors. And at the end of the day, we are not adding a, 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 the counselors at the rate that we need to be doing. And also, we need to be looking at what the mental health task force that the school system uh, currently has right now and go by what they recommend at the end of the day. That is what is most important. Next, um, Drake. To reduce the mental health stress and the stigma, first, we need to institute a mental health day, just like we have Unity Day, where we have professionals come into, the, into all those schools and say, hey, if you have a problem, it's OK. It gets dark sometimes, but the morning comes. But sometimes some of these students, they're not realizing that. 
Also, counselors is a great idea, and that's wonderful. I 100% agree with you, Connor. But counselors take a while, and we both know that. We both know that. But we also got to realize that mental health is in everything we do as students, from the amount of homework you get, the amount of times you go outside at school. So we got to give students more time to go outside and to take breaks and relax. We The school gardens, like I was talking about earlier, the student is, is just feeling overwhelmed in his math class, and they send him to the principal's office. That's not going to do anything. Send them into a garden and they can just meditate and relax. That does everything. Or more ele- uh, more opportunities for recess in middle schools. An hour weekly recess in total a week. That can be three 20-minute sessions or two 30-minute sessions. I remember middle school when we had recesses. It was just a better day overall. This can help our mental health. Sorry. Thank you. Um, next, Princess. So I 100% agree. I am a person who struggles with mental health as well. And so I think that I would want to, if elected, go into schools and talk to kids about how you can be a a highly successful student and still struggle with mental health. I've had anxiety since I was five years old, and I just currently got the help that I needed, not because the help wasn't there, but because I didn't have access to it. And so I think that's something that our schools need to work better on and seeing that just because a student is successful doesn't mean that they're not struggling. But I also would say not just uh, counselors, but also school psychiatrists and school psychologists. These are uh, trained people who don't necessarily have to juggle uh, someone's course selection, but are able to focus on a student's mental health um, individually and case by case basis. But if a student just needs to come to them and talk to them, because sometimes that's just what you need to do. And so I think that should be a major priority for AACPS. Awesome. Thank you. Does anyone have any rebuttals? Connor, go ahead. Something that we all need to think about, at the end of the day, it's going to be one of us three on that diet. Right now, we are in a different world, and we need to focus on how we are going to support um, our students if this crisis is, is uh, turns out to be longer than we thought or think it's going to be. We need to make sure that our counselors have access to our students in this time of of great crisis. Yes. Princess, go ahead. So, um, two things. Um, Our counselors and school psychiatrists and psychologists are able to uh, Zoom or I think uh, Google Meet, whichever one, to talk to students. Um, I know as a student with mental health, uh, I got a call, so they're trying to reach out to students and they're connecting with us, so that is something that is happening. And to Drake, um, I just think that we need to be careful with um, putting more of a toll on our teachers when it comes to homework and when it comes to um, trying to mandate things because that's going to be tricky to enforce. Okay. Thank you. I have a rebuttal. Go ahead. Um, that wouldn't be tr- tricky to, re- to reinforce over the summer. All the time, teachers have trains to say, hey, only 30 minutes of homework a night because this. The more homework you get a night, the less time you have to do the other things that students do. Play sports, work a job, and um, take care of your siblings. So then students are up half the night until like 2 a.m. doing this homework. And you have to wake up at 5.30 to catch a bus to go to school. Then you fall asleep in class. And they're wondering, why are you falling asleep in my, in my class? Because I had all this homework and I couldn't balance it with this hectic world we live in. Um, that's time. You have another rebuttal, Connor, to this question? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the one thing uh, about referring to about the, uh, the homework situation is that that's not how the American education system is set up. That is something that we necessarily have not set up our school system to, to function that way. That is something that we can look forward to in the future, but right now we need to focus on how we handle this COVID crisis. Um, yes. Princess. Oh, Prince Go ahead. So I also wanted to say something different to that is a lot of we start a lot later in the year than our counterparts in a lot of our uh, other parts of the country. We start in September. A lot of people start in August. But uh, AP testing, IB testing is still the same time. So teachers are having to give homework so we can be prepared for these tests that are the same date no matter when your school starts. Thank you, Princess. Uh, Yes, go ahead should not be an entirely another class. It should not be an extension of the class. It should be a review session. And plus, if uh, who's to say teachers can't give out uh, recommended reading? They can, Of course, teachers can always do that. And if I'm failing history class, and I'm failing math class, I'm, I'm passing math, and I get an hour for history, 
and an hour for math, why would I spend an hour on two things? I should use more of my time on the thing I'm failing at and really just review the thing that I'm passing. So more homework is not always the answer. And Less time. can be the answer. Sorry about that. Next question. How could AACPS improve school safety? We'll start with Princess. Okay, so um, school safety is a big thing. We did the double entry doors on schools, and I think that's important, but I also think that stricter um, rules should be in place for students who are deciding to open the door for to let um, people in after skipping or students who are skipping, because I think that if we are constantly letting these behaviors continue and perpetuate, it's going to be dangerous, especially with our schools being places where sometimes thousands for high schools and some middle schools too of students are there and our parents expect us to be safe. And so our schools need to do a better job of enforcing this by handing out heftier punishments if students decide to break these rules. Thank you, Princess. Connor? So I agree exactly with what Princess said, but in addition to that, uh, something that we can do to make sure we know who's in our building, we could have our, in this. I would not implement, if elected, uh, this unless I would consult with uh, my peers, but have a lanyard for students that have, like, a, like the teachers for wear their IDs, have a student ID as a lanyard, um, just so that we know exactly who's in the building, and so that if you see someone walking out with a lanyard, you kind of know that they're not necessarily in the place that they should be within our building. Thank you, Connor. Drake? Um, for inside threats, for you know, fights, drug deals, and stuff like that that goes on within our schools, we've all seen it, we've all heard about it. We just got to start checking the cameras more. I've seen in my school where they have this big grid of all the cameras in the school, no one is manning it. So, of course, you have this camera in the stairwell, but if they don't know that someone is manning it, of course, they're going to keep doing this bad stuff. Also, yes, more punishment. So, we say, hey, this is not acceptable. But for stuff like fighting, drugs, you got to ask, why are you using these drugs? What is going on at home that you're not getting the joy of life, that you need these extra stuff, these extra legal substances to get? Why are you doing this? Why are you fighting? Why are you acting out? We got to make sure that the, le that, the, that, that the students get the help they need. Thank you, Drake. Um, Princess, you had a rebuttal? So, yes, I 100% agree versus... Um, my school does man our cameras. They have been doing that more frequently, and we have been seeing it come down, and so have our suspension rates. But I think that to also do that, we need more um, uh, adult slash teacher to student contact. I think that was a heavily effective way of making sure one, students felt safe, and students felt like the environment was friendly as well. And to Connor, I would ask um, what would happen if a student forgot their lanyard. So I think that uh, things like this are always tricky to enforce as well. Connor, go ahead. So the way that it would be set up is kind of the way that I would kind of envision it is it's kind of given out at the beginning of the school year. And if you forget it, you'd kind of, you'd have to go to like the office and they can verify who you are. Uh, like the secretary or something can go and um, verify who you are using power school. Yes, go ahead, princess. Would we enforce this for our elementary and middle schoolers as well? Okay, Drake, your rebuttal. First, go ahead. Oh, I'll let Connor respond to that so he doesn't forget. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dre. Um, I right now I would kind of start. I would kind of experiment with the way that it, doing it for high school. Um, see how effective it is. It wouldn't be something that we do system wide right away. That I would. That would kind of envision that. Um, so I hope that answers your your concern. Thank you, and Dre, your button. Just a point to add, we can always just look at how other school systems are doing this type of thing. We all know that other school systems, even in our state, use lanyards and stuff like this because we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Here, There's nothing new under the sun, just different ways how to do it. So we can look at them. Also, if you forget your lanyard, everybody has their lunch number. Type that in. Princess, go ahead. I do think it would be semi reinventing the wheel because we are one of the largest counties in the country. And so to mandate this countywide would be uh, semi reinventing the wheel because it probably, I don't know the logistics, but if I look at it, I don't know if it's been done on a 84,000 student scale. Thank you. Um, Drake, would you like to respond? I'm not reinventing the wheel. You might just be making the wheel bigger. 
we have 83,000 students. If school systems do it with, what, 10,000 students, to see how they do it and just do it on a larger scale. If they scan kids in with a little barcode thing, we can just do that, get some barcode sensors. Or if they just checked the, do a spot check of your um, lanyard, just do that. It's sometimes just making the wheel a little bigger and making it work to our standards. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to the next question. What is the function of charter schools in AACPS? How do they differ from other schools? We'll start with Drake. Well, I was just on the uh, on a call with Chesapeake Science Point the other day, and they're just students just like us. They just get, I guess, just, their funding comes from a different place. That's primarily the main difference with Chesapeake Science Point and other charter schools. And charter schools primarily focus on one thing, Chesapeake Science Point, science and math uh, in mathematics. They just put more emphasis on those. So what we need to do, Chesapeake Science Point only has a few sports teams. And if I was SMOB, I was talking with a few students, and they said, hey, why can't we play sports? Why can't we have a volleyball team? That's what the girls were saying. Why don't we have a volleyball team? Why don't we have a women's lacrosse team like these bigger schools? We want to play our fellow classmates. Because oftentimes you hear the label, charter school, charter school, charter school, and you might think these students are uppity and they're better than you, but really they're just students like us. We just got to start getting to know them and start just listening to them to hear their demands. Thank you. Princess? So, yes, I 100% agree. However, the students at these charter schools are on a semi-accelerated learning path. Um, one of my friends goes to Chesapeake Science Point, and I believe she was taking Algebra 2 in ninth grade. So they're just a little bit ahead in the math and science department. But there are schools that anyone in the county uh, can go to. You just have to apply, I believe, and then meet the criteria to be accepted. And I um, also plan on meeting with the CSP delegation. Connor? Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. What is the function of charter schools in AACPS, and how do they differ from other schools? So in our county, our charter schools, um, their students are AACPS students, and they are rightfully to be represented by us as a student member of the Board of Education. The difference between it is just that they do their curriculum a bit differently, but they are still AACPS students that deserve representation and a voice. Um, I have worked, I've also had a lovely conversation with CSP and I would love to kind of get more of their input if elected to kind of uh, how we as a school system um, can improve charter schools or the interaction between the school system is, and, the, and, um, and the school system and the charter schools. I couldn't tell you exactly how to do that because I did not go to a charter school myself. So that's why I would consult them. Awesome. Any rebuttals? Okay, next question. What are you most unprepared for in your role as student member on the board, and how will you address this weakness? We'll start with Connor. So currently I'm enrolled in the International Baccalaureate program like both of my colleagues here are. Um, it is something, I understand that the, uh, the time commitment is um, it's a lot uh, out of school time, but uh, that's something that I'm I'm prepared for in a sense because I've never missed that amount of school, but it's something that I work with my very supportive teachers who can get me through the uh, year successfully and know that they can because they are, they're amazing. So I know that I have that support system to get me through the uh, school year, even though it can be a challenge. Awesome. Drake? Well, I think the biggest issue was try, would be trying to deal with each student's problem individually. I have no problems advocating for the students, but I want to make sure I meet every student's needs, not a few, just make sure everybody gets an equitable education like we all deserve. But also um, with the workload, yeah, this might be a question coming up, but you know, I have a twin brother, a uh, shout out to Drew, who's watching right now, and he can just help me. He can be, he'll be in the class, and I have friends I'll be in the class. So, you know, I can ask them, like, hey, we'll be we doing math class today. We'll be we doing history class today. And they'll be happy to say, okay, Drake, we went over the Ottoman Empire, this, this, and that. So um, just to, just to uh, address that. But also, maybe also reading the budget, because, you know, I don't come from a financial background. None of us probably do. And just, you know, but I know the school system has resources to help the student member. I can probably ask the other board members to say, hey, what does this mean, the budget? What does that mean? How do I get through this? Thank you. Princess? 
So I, I also am in the IB program. However, I have been planning to run for SMOP since I was in eighth grade. So me and my counselor set up my schedule to give me three open class periods. So that's not really one of my primary concerns especially since uh, this year, because I've been advocating so much and I've just been doing a lot, I've missed 23 class days and my grades haven't been affected. But I would say the thing that I'm most unprepared for is um, any incidences that might happen, whether it be for COVID or whether it be for mental health or whether it be bias or motivated incidences, which are things that you can't plan for, but do happen. And I think that as student member of the board, I would want to console not only the um, students, but also try and work with the persons or people who were affected. Thank you. Any rebuttals? Connor, go ahead. I would like to kind of add on to my answer. As far as this new COVID crisis comes up, there's nothing that, as Princess said, uh, there's nothing that we as, uh, as individuals or as the school system know what's gonna happen in the future. So I would uh, listen to the health professionals that are currently uh, working hard uh, to ensure that the uh, correct information is out and consult my fellow students with making decisions on um, policy that, are, that is related to uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Any other rebuttals? Princess, go ahead. I would also like to um, expand on my answer. I also want to be prepared for any decision that we make, whether it be for pass or fail or for grades, and how that will negatively or positively impact our students, and just listen to how our students are um, feeling and advocating for themselves in this situation because uh, COVID has severely messed with a lot of people's grades and education. Thank you. Okay, we have a quick brain break question so you guys can relax. What is one fun fact about you? And we'll start with Princess. Um, I was adopted when I was seven from foster care and my favorite color is pink because I love how pink in its darkest shade is very dark and in its lightest shade is very vibrant and I like to model my life after that and I try to tell myself that even if my life is dark right now, I can always get myself to a vibrant hot pink um, spot. Awesome. Um, Connor? So I'm very fortunate to live in a waterfront community in uh, Pasadena. So every day I try to go out and watch the sunset. Uh, some of you may have seen them using the hashtag cross uh, sunsets. And that's kind of something that I uh, do to at the end of every day, I try to at least, to kind of reflect on uh, what happened and how I can make myself be a better person um, every day. Drake? One fun fact is, I think I can show it. You want to count? I have a twin brother. His name is... Oh. All right, that's true. That was your cameo. Yeah! <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Next question. Oh, you have uh, something to say? Go ahead, Connor. Another fun fact. There are two candidates that have twin brothers. Shout out to Kevin. <laughs> Okay, Princess, go ahead. Bigger fun fact, I have a twin too. It's, I'm just kidding, we're the same person. Okay, next question. What is your opinion on the installation of cell towers on school property, inspired by James from Shadyside Elementary? We'll start with Drake. Cell towers, you just have to look at a few important things. Number one, how would it affect our students, their health? Is there anything, any like negative consequences to cell towers? Also, how will it affect the environment? We do not want to impede on the environmental stuff around our beautiful schools. Then you don't want it to be an eyesore. That'd be the least of my concerns, if it's an eyesore or not, but you just don't want it to be ugly. Like I know they have one at Corcoran Middle School. That's kind of, that's pretty nice. It says CMS. Now I'm not saying it's ugly, Princess. I'm saying it's really nice. I like seeing it down the highway. So just a lot of factors that go into that and I would just look at everything and you know, leave no stone unturned. Okay. Um, Princess, you're next. Yes. 
Okay, so I thought you were coming from my middle school for a second. No, um, I 100% agree with Drake, but I also would want to listen to the parents and community input. Um, I know that there are a lot of people who do not necessarily agree with cell towers, and in their area, it's not in their best interest to put one up. And so I think that the best thing that Anne Arundel County can do is listen to the concerns of the public and follow that, because no amount of money is worth the health or the concern or how uncomfortable it would make the students and uh, the people in the community. Thank you, Princess. Connor? So I would look how, um, I would do some independent research on my own to see how cell towers uh, affect uh, people. And I'd listen and consult to medical professionals to see what their take is on it. And I'd also consult the, the, um, the community to see how they feel about it and kind of make a, uh, collect all of their thoughts and make a educated decision at that point. I'd also assess the amount of revenue it brings in. Now, now that is not going to be something that that overpowers everything else, but it's just something I would like to take in as a full uh, decision. Okay. Any rebuttals, Princess? I would more like to add on. Um, there was a cell tower at my middle school while I attended Corcoran, and we didn't have any problems with it. But at the same time, there wasn't a community outpouring of people who were 100% against the cell tower. So I think that it depends on how the community feels, and that's something that me and the school board should and probably would take into consideration. Any other rebuttals for this question? OK, moving on. How will you solicit opinions from students across all parts of the county? This is from Rafi from Chesapeake Science Point. Connor. There are a multitude of ways that I can solicit student opinions, um, whether it's through technology or not. So I, uh, if elected, I promise I'll stay more uh, active on social media to connect with students. I'll also uh, stay in contact with the SGA advisors to get in contact with students, um, like I have been within the past week and a half when uh, campaigning to uh, my peers. I'd also just try to visit as many schools as I can. I'm not going to promise that I can visit every school because we have 124 schools. Um, but I'll try to get as, out to as many as I can, talk to as many students as I can. I'm a very sociable person. I love to talk about the issues that actually matter with my peers. Thank you. Um, Drake? So one of my platforms is putting suggestion boxes in every school where it's by the front office, you have a problem or an opinion, write it on the card, put it in. Hey, let's play music as we walk into the school. Principal says, okay, then let's do it. Problem solved. But for bigger issues where you have to meet me face to face, I just I would just sit down with you. We can do these webinars, wonderful with the uh, wonderful technology we have. But also we want to make sure students know they have a student member of the Board of Education. So another one of my points is opening up small voting to every middle and high schooler. Because go around and ask some of your friends, do they know who the current smob is or who the past current smobs are? I guarantee they're not. Because I did this with my own friends. They said, Drake, I had never heard about this before you're electing, or I heard about it in passing. I may have forgot about it. It's not because our smobs are doing bad jobs. It's because we just have everything else going wrong, going 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 uh, around in our in our in our lives, like football games, basketball games, homecomings, proms, graduations. So it's good. Maybe one week out of the year, we take all the middle and high schoolers and we just get them to vote. And that's and just, your okay. I have a smob. We're gonna move on to princess. And then Connor. Uh, can you re-ask the question? Yes. Um, how will you solicit opinions from students across mm -hmm. all parts of the county? Okay. So I 100% agree with what my constituents also said, but I would take the leap to also say, um, email me, DM me, get me on TikTok. Anyway, I 100% love to talk to people. I will respond, and I'm always on my phone. So I, when I see your email or I see your text or I see anything, I'm there. Um, I also want to say that I can commit to going to not every school, but most of the schools, and that is a part of my plan. I also want to create a small advisory where I talk to middle and high school students in the county, but I also want to expand that and have some sort of teleconference with the students and maybe even the principals. That way I'm hearing from all different types of students and not just um, student leaders, because I think that sometimes in translation we can lose some of our students who aren't necessarily student leaders. Thank you. Um, any rebuttals? And remember, a rebuttal is not an extension of your answer. It has to be a rebuttal. Connor, go ahead. 
uh, to comment on um, Drake's comment about widespreading smog voting, that is not the power of the student member of the Board of Education. It is the power of CRASP. As CRASP president, it's something we've been looking into, into expanding. Um, but I really feel like this year's election can kind of um, really prove that we are able to widespread voting, um, not just on election day at a certain school. Any other rebuttals? Go ahead, Drake. Yeah, I would say, like I said before, I would, you know, work, I would work to expand it. So in this case, I would work with CRASS to expand it to make sure, you know, that every student, because we want everybody to know that if you have a problem, you have a SMOB that will help you get through it and answer it. Thank you. Next question. What do you think would be the best choice of action regarding the grading policy for the fourth marking period slash second semester? Stefan from North County joining this question. Princess. So um, I personally don't think there is a best option. I think that no matter what happens and what we choose, whether it be to go to SRU or whether it be to have grades, there are going to be students who are majorly inconvenienced. Um, I know as a junior, that a lot of kids don't necessarily want to go to pass or fail because um, their grades are the highest they've ever been. But I also know a lot of kids who want to because uh, third quarter and not being able to be in school and see their teachers and talk to their teachers has heavily affected their grades. But I also um, would say I want to talk to as many teachers and students as possible so that way we're getting the best interest of everybody and we're doing what's equitable even if it's not necessarily in the best interest of a few people because at the end of the day um, we're a county full of 84,000 people and it's not fair for us to inconvenience 65,000 for um, I don't know math for uh, X amount. And that's fine. Um, Connor? In my opinion, I feel like we need to go to pass fail purely because I would like to give the, the, uh, the benefit of doubt to the students who do not have access to, uh, to education, to the, um, to the Chromebooks and to the Wi-Fi. Some of the um, things that we're not able to do as a school system is provide Wi-Fi, and some of them have to go to our high school par parking lots. Now, some, for some students who are in the situation, they can't go to the, to the high school parking lots. So this is something that we need to implement so that our students are not stressed out about their grades in this time of great danger. Thank you. Drake? Um, I agree with Connor. We could just go to pass fail. And for all you students with all A's, you got to think about it. You're getting these A's for colleges and for your careers, and that's great. But colleges also, this is not a local thing. This is a worldwide pandemic. So they're going to know this is unprecedented times. A pass or a fail is just as good as an A or a B. So don't be wor don't don't worry about what you got now. Just worry about making it through this pandemic. Thank you, um, Princess. You had a rebuttal to um, both of my opponents. I would also say we need to keep in mind the hard work that a lot of students have put in, and how a lot of students depend on their grades for gratification. And so we can't just see it in the perspective of grades for college when a lot of kids use their grades as um, a sense of a light spot in their life or a sense of pride or a sense of um, achievement. And so I think that we just need to keep in mind that no matter the outcome, there will be students who are heavily affected. Thank you. Um, Drake, I saw your hand first. Go ahead. Oh, that's just the problem. We're doing, putting too much emphasis on grades, and this is what causes students to burn out. You see a lot of time the top 10% of classes, I mean of students in classes, they're burnt out. So we gotta take less emphasis off grades and more emphasis on what you do. We just gotta let students know you're special just by being here. You were made special. No one's like you in this world. Thank you. Connor, go ahead. We can't hear you. Can you unmute your mic? Yes, sorry, I forgot about unmuting. You're fine. Go ahead. Um, we could also say the same exact thing about the opposite reaction. The students who, uh, who um, kind of need that gratification, they're trying their hardest, but they just don't have the access to the resources, and then that can negatively affect them in the same way that it would positively affect. Okay. Thank you. Next question. How will you make sure that your voice is heard when working with AACPS senior staff and other board members? We'll start with Drake. Well, I'd make sure that whenever I see a problem, I speak up 
and speak my mind and fight the best I can to get to resolve that problem. I hope that the board members and any bot senior staff at AACPS, I don't think they would be biased against someone who's younger than them because most of the kids they help to, to make adults are younger than them. So I think we would have a good relationship. We just got to say, hey, yes, I'm younger than you, but you still have to respect my ideas and respect my beliefs. Thank you, Princess. So um, I 100% agree with Drake, but I would also say um, my relationships that I've previously built in being within CRASC and being in uh, Dr. Rolato's teen advisory for the past two years, I've been able to get to know Dr. Rolato. And I also served on the PTSA executive staff with um, Candace Antwine. And I've known a few of the other board members through testifying and through events and all. So um, I've gotten to know them as people. And I know um, that is one of my... Um, one of my assets, but I also think that listening is important because you um, have to pick and choose your battles. And I think that um, in being an executive member on the PTSA, I learned that there are times to speak and there are times to listen. And that is how I was able to get a lot of what I needed to get done through advocacy for the students is listening, but speaking when necessary. Thank you. Connor, go ahead. Um, also, in my experience of CRASC, I have had the wonderful opportunity to work with many members of, the seniors, of Dr. Lotto's senior staff and within uh, different board members with different um, opportunities. Um, I've gotten to know many of them, and I feel like I have a level of comfort where I can come with them to a concern if, in a respectable way if I have a disagreement or a concern about their stance on a policy and something that I can um, use to help me uh, represent all students of Anderon County. Thank you. Jake, you have a rebuttal? Um, to both of their points, yes, relationships are great, but we want to make sure these senior staff members, these board members, aren't just liking you because they know you. They shouldn't have to have a relationship with these students to respect the students' opinions and their beliefs. And they can set the precedent because we the same thing tends to happen with some teachers. You might see a disrespectful teacher because, of course, the students are young, younger than them, but we're going to make sure that you know you're, you're respected no matter you know your age, race, religion, anything. You're just respected because you are a human being. Thank you. Princess, go ahead. In building those relationships, that's what the respect was based on because we were student advocates. We were um, members of CRASC. We were president and vice president. And so that's how they got to know us by us testifying, us sharing our opinions, seeing us at events, and us talking to them about policies we agreed and didn't agree on. So it's not just because we just have a relationship and we're friends, but it's because we were student advocates first before we even ran for SMOB. Thank you. Connor, go ahead, your rebuttal. I would echo exactly what Princess said. We've worked with her the past six years. I've had the opportunity to work with Princess in many uh, opportunities, and we've gotten to know um, the staff fondly over those uh, over that time. And I can feel like that we can use that to further um, our our um, our ability to represent. Uh, Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Once again, we want to make sure that, yes, you're in CRASC, but not every student has heard about CRASC. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't hear about CRASC until about my ninth grade year, and that's just, that's just how it is. We have all this other stuff going on. So we want to make sure that students, if you want to advocate later in your educational career, you're still going to be respected. So you, we want to make sure that you don't always need this prior experience. If you see a problem, we need to commend them and say, yes, you can speak up. Yes, you can speak your mind. Princess, sorry, hand first. Go ahead. So I would um, echo that point to um, the board doesn't just listen to students of craft. There are students who testify at the board meetings all of the time. So Verner Park girls testified, and out of that came a mental health task force. So it's not just about a relationship, and that's how we get everything we need to get done. But it's as students talking to the board members as people who have concerns and see things that need to improve in the county. So it's not about prior experience. It's just um, something that we um, have. Thank you. Connor, go ahead. In addition to Princess's point, Dr. Olato's team is a phenomenal group of professionals that will definitely, that know how to um, take, uh, how to listen to our voices in a very constructive way. Sometimes we just don't see some of the points that they see or some of the operations, but they are always respectful to our opinions. And through that, we have been able to uh, further work with them more if elected. 
Okay. We're going to move on to the next question. These are our final three. What are some things we need to prioritize for our students once this pandemic is over? Sophia from Old Mill High. We'll start with Connor. So we need to expand more of what we are providing our students via curriculum. So part of my platform is the financial literacy component. We need to make sure that we are ask, we are um, kind of giving our students this, these resources to be successful after high school. A lot of students don't know how to do, your, do, our, do their taxes or what the difference between a credit card or a debit card uh, is even as in their senior year. And that is a problem for me. So that is something that we need to focus on after we deal with this pandemic. Thank you. Um, Drake? Um, first, we need to prioritize just making schools, the facilities better. So bathroom restorations, I would put that as the top five on my list. One of the things I would fight tooth and nail for. Next, we're going to make sure every student has access. You often hear about the achievement gap, but some students aren't achieving because they can't stay after school. So I would institute activity buses for high school students. So every student in high school with a bigger workload can stay after or enjoy extracurricular activities. And lastly, I would make sure we just, you know, make sure students are more engaged and you're not just coming to school and going home. Something more implementing more things like more clubs, stuff to make to beautify your school so you can help your school succeed and just just keep students engaged. Thank you. Princess? I 100% agree, but I would go to my top five are early childhood education and access, the opportunity gap, our teachers, um, mental health resources, and I would finish it out with letting students know what's happening in our county. Like, for example, um, things that we don't even realize, like dress code. Um, right now they're trying to ban leggings so it's things like this that students don't even realize are happening in our school system and i know that if students heard about or knew about they would feel passionate about um and not only that but we are seeing now these unprecedented times that it's not just funding that's essential but it's the access for example we're giving out breakfast, lunch, and dinner to our AACPS students, but if students aren't able to get to those places that are giving out breakfast, lunch, and dinner, then they might not be able to acquire them. So I think that access is essential when we're looking at our priorities overall. Thank you. Drake and then Connor. Drake, go ahead. So this is more towards um, Princess. So you talked about that opportunity gap in early childhood education, but like what specific plans would you have in place to address these issues because these are just big issues you can't just say i'm going to address it I, can we hear a platform okay go ahead princess of course so um i 100 one i want to put more funding towards um uh teachers for pre-k eci head start get more funding for buses so it's easy for our students to get there also i would also want to um put more community building circles in our schools so that they're done countywide from uh, pre-K through 12th grade because I've been in a few of them and I know how effective they are and we should open up the training to our students because I know some crafts kids got trained and it was very effective. Thank you. Connor, your rebuttal. First of all, while I did not mention a lot of things of my colleagues, I do believe that they are very important. Um, just as a FYI, uh, within the current budget, they did add um, high school activity buses. It's not like perfect as far as the plan, but they have already implemented that within this budget. Princess, your rebuttal. And I would also say, I, I just want to ask Drake, um, how do you plan on, what do you plan on taking funding from to fund some of your um, ag what's it called, the environmental plan, the peer plans and stuff like that. And also, how do you plan on getting us to, into religious institutions since that's not allowed in schools, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Well, um, so with the environmental plan, solar panel companies, uh, solar panel companies, they will pay for the construction, the manpower, all of that to institute solar panels on school roofs, and they only take 15% of what the power you make, and they'll use that, like they did with the solar panel field that we currently have in the county. 
And with the synagogues and stuff, if there's a rule that we can't go into a synagogue to make people more closer with the Jewish community, we can just change that rule. That seems like a dumb rule because that rule's in place so you don't force another religion on another on, on the same time. Um, unfortunately, we have to keep it to two rebuttals per person. So we're going to move on to the next question. If elected, would you use power or influence in your role? We're going to start with Princess. I would definitely use my influence and then power when necessary. I think that influence is essential because power seems domineering, but in Influence, when you have influence and you use your influence effectively, you are speaking not only for your constituents, but you're speaking for your community. And I think that's essential as SMOB because we have full voting rights. We have power, but our influence is what got us those full voting rights. Thank you. Connor? Primarily, it would be influence. And I'll tell you why. So... I'm only, if elected, I would be only one vote on that board, but there is still a full, whole other member, uh, members on that board of education that have, uh, that outvote me, obviously, um, so that I would use that influence to, to um, have a productive conversation about what um, our students value and kind of see where we can compromise if possible, and then use the power when we are actually um, voting on policies and decisions. Thank you. Drake? So for me, I would use power, but not my power, the power of the students. The school board has to respond to what's best for the students. So I would let the community and the students know what's going on. And if you don't like it, come down to the school board and I'll help you say, hey, we don't like this. Hey, we want this. We want that. So I would just make sure the students can use their voices to the best of their ability. Because right now I feel in some schools and some communities, that's not really happening. Whereas other schools, they're getting more, more power and more voice. And I want to make sure everybody has the same power and voice as the other students in the county. Thank you. Princess, your rebuttal. I would like to rebuttal Drake's point of just coming down. I think that opening up access is, transportation is a big problem for a lot of people in our county. So I think that I would want to use my influence and get more people to email me and text me and hear their voices that way, especially because a lot of people who um, need the most advocacy aren't able to advocate for themselves because of restraints, whether it be economic or just time constraints, because I know that school board meetings happen on Wednesdays, and that's when a lot of church services are as well. Thank you. Drake? Go ahead and then I'm fine with the NAACP. Yes, emails work. Yes, letters work. Letter write can campaigns are wonderful. But actually going down to the board gets you the best results because then they're looking you face to face, eye to eye, and saying, hey, I don't like this. What are you going to do? And you can demand an answer right there. Whereas an email, they might take a while to respond back to you. Or, and I would much like all, every student, because this can go into, into your adulthood. If you see a problem, go to your elected officials. Don't just say, hey, I'll write an email. You can go down to them. We can carpool. They have organizations like the NAACP to carpool down there. Thank you. Connor, your rebuttal. So I would like to echo a lot of the points Prince is making as far as social outreach. Uh, to, to furthermore on that, uh, there are two uh, models of representation. You have the trustee model and you have the delegate model. Trustee is basically, um, if, you don't, if you're not aware, you, vote, you would vote for one of us and we would just do whatever we think because you trust me. And then the delegate model is kind of consulting your constituents um, in as many decisions as you can. And I um, promise that I will do as much as I can to be a delegate model so that... Um, any other rebuttals? Princess, go ahead. So I would like to echo some of the points that both of my opponents made. The delegate model is the essential model, and that's when you're using your influence, not power. And I would also like to echo access. Access is one of the hardest things to come by in our county, but it's the most imperative for success. And it's not necessarily just as easy as driving down to the board. My mom doesn't my mom had a job, and so I wasn't always able to get to the board. And I know kids who have had to Uber, kids who are sick and weren't able to, and so they had to send public comment via email. So it's access. Drake, go ahead. Yes, access. You can say that. Of course people are going to have access. But when you're really passionate about the issues, yes, you have church services, but they'll make a way to get those issues done. And the thing is, we're not informing every student, every family about all the issues that the board is going. Yes, we send out these new newsletters and stuff, 
But with everything else going on, we don't we don't be we people don't read those email and newsletters like they really should because they're just so busy. So we're gonna make sure we just yes inform the public more so then they can get more access by demanding that access. Thank you. We're gonna move on to our last question. If you do not win this position, what can we look forward to seeing from you next year? Inspired by Nazaraha from MacArthur. Drake, we'll start with you. First of all, go Eagles. Thank you, Nazaraha, for this wonderful question. Um, I, I went to MacArthur. But right now, I'm the president of the Anne Arundel County NAACP Youth and Cause Division. So you can best believe I'm going to stay. If I don't win, I'm going to be at the board advocating for some of these issues. These are not just stuff I wrote up just because I say, hey, this will get me elected, because I care. We can put gardens in the schools so we can make sure students get better mental health. We can lessen the homework load and still have students get a quality education. So if I don't win, you will see me at the school board with the NAACP, with the Caucus of African American Leaders, with other community groups, and we will be advocating like we have done in the past. Thank you. Princess? So I 100% um, would either stay in my role as vice president, run again for re-election, or uh, become president of CRASC, because I have been advocating for the past uh, five to six years for the issues that I'm advocating for now. And I um, have spoken at county council meetings, I've spoken at board meetings, and I will continue to do so because advocating for you guys is not only what I'm passionate about for you, but it's been a way for me to overcome my um, mental health issues and me to find a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that's the most important thing to do is to one, represent you guys effectively, but make sure that every voice is heard, especially those kids who aren't able to advocate for themselves. Thank you. Connor? I would run again is for the current position that I have now as CRASS president and try to um, advocate for the same things that I would uh, that I have on my board platform so that the change that I would like to be see to be done is still um, implemented just do, through a different um, alleyway. Okay. Any rebuttals to any answers? Okay. That is the end of our questions. Thank you for viewing the 2020 Student Member of the Board debate for Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Best of luck to all three candidates at the upcoming elections. Have a great evening, stay safe, and stay home.